Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another edition of the Spurs Chat Podcast where in this episode I've got a very special guest, returning guest, Martin Lipton, of course the chief sports writer at the Sun newspaper. In this episode we will be talking about all things Tottenham Hotspur and of course the January transfer window. Martin, Happy New Year to you. How are you and how is it covering the World Cup? Happy New Year, Chris. Yeah, um, the World Cup was a, a conflicting experience, I have to say, five weeks in the desert. Uh, everything that I thought would be good was good. Everything I thought would be bad was bad. Uh, on the pitch, it was outstanding, actually. It was a terrific tournament. I think all the better because of uh, the timing in that players weren't tired. So there was much more pace in the games than you'd normally get uh, at a tournament. Uh, but, you know, the summer tournaments where they tend to be slow, that there is intensity about a great number of games, which is good to see. The right team won. I think just about the right player certainly uh, won. Uh, shame for England. They went close. They weren't quite good enough. Sometimes that yeah. happens. I'd rather lose playing like that than lose as we have in the past. It's the first time that I can remember England dominating possession against a major nation, which they did. Now, part of that was France, uh, but a lot of it was England. And in the end, they just fell short. But as an experience, uh, as I said, conflicted because there were some really great parts of it, but other things were difficult. No question about it. And then you go back to Spurs and also conflicted because some of it's great and lots of it's difficult. I said to you before, Martin, I think supporting Spurs and supporting England, they're very, very similar. Um, were you there for the uh, Brazil game when Richarlison scored that fantastic goal, the goal of the tournament? No, I wasn't. I was uh, in the media centre. So uh, I saw a lot of games, actually. I did see about 11 games out of the, in the 13 days of the group phase, which was a yeah. lot of football. And I come back from another game just in time to see that at the media centre. I can't remember which game it was. But there were so many. That was my. That was a problem. Actually, I saw too much football. It's hard to believe that, but I did. I felt shattered uh, at the end of it. Don't, don't get the violins out, obviously. But it was. Uh, it was quite a difficult experience. But he looked a really good player, didn't he? And then he gets injured. Right. And and Ben Tenko looked a really good player, and then he gets injured. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Gosh. Here we go. There's a pattern to it. Uh, well, Martin, let's get um, into talking about Tottenham Hotspur. Of course, we're in the January transfer window at the moment. We will talk about that shortly. But how are you feeling, as well as being uh, the chief sports writer at the Sun newspaper? You are also a Tottenham Hotspur fan. How are you feeling as a fan at the moment with uh, with the season so far? I think I'm like everybody else, actually. Um, a mixture of, of frustration, annoyance hope, expectation, all together. And there's a, a sense of dissatisfaction. And yet, in the knowledge that that could all transform in the space of four, five months, uh, it could still end up being a fantastic season. It just, at the moment, doesn't feel like it's going to be. And I, I guess things have been made worse from a Spurs perspective by the fact that the other lot are doing so well. And Let's not pretend they're not. They've been excellent. They are. They have been the best team in the league in the first half of the season. They're deservedly a top and deservedly 11 points clear of us. And let's hope we can put a huge spanner in the works on Sunday week. Martin, when you look at it, um, Spurs fifth in the Premier League table. We're in the last 16 of the Champions League. We're out of the League Cup. We're just about to start the journey in the FA Cup, hoping we go far in that competition. Um when you look at those stats, you know, fifth in the Premier League, we're only a couple of points off third spot. It's not a bad place to be, is it? No, and that's the bizarre thing. I, I don't think there have been more than three or four occasions all season where you'd actually think they've played well, but they were getting results. It helps when you've got an outstanding centre forward, no doubt about that. Uh, yeah. And then if you add in the fact that, you know, some of their best players haven't either played well or been available for much of the season, you could argue that the, the, it's been a pretty decent season. It just doesn't feel like that at the moment. Uh, and there is that is, again, the conflict, which is, I think, at the heart of every, every Spurs fan, that things aren't as bad as they feel, but they're not as good as they should be. And, and it is a strange situation because just on a results basis, it isn't terrible at all, you know, uh, in, in a position to, to strike. Uh, but I don't think there's any real belief or faith that it's going to happen. What I would point out is that people were in a similar place this time last year, and it turned out far better than we all expected or thought. And there is, you know, it's 20 league matches to go. It's over half a season, albeit only just over half a season. Um, 
and the FA Cup starts and Europe is set to re resume next month. And it, as I said, it could end up being a, a really great season. It just, I, I don't think anyone really truly believes it's going to be. Well, I think we need another January transfer window like the last one. We, we will come on to talk about that shortly. Um, let's talk about Antonio Conte because, of course, his contract runs out at Spurs on the 30th of June. This is quite an unusual situation, isn't it? You, you know, you, you go into January um, and all of us Spurs fans at the moment don't know whether Antonio Conte is going to be uh, the Spurs boss next season. Do you think the board know at the moment whether he's going to be the manager next season? No, because I don't think he knows. That's the problem. I don't think he, he seems to make his mind or change his mind from day to day. He changes like the wind almost. And then again, he's always been like this. We shouldn't be surprised. He is hard work. Uh, you know, you could imagine asking him for breakfast what he wants, and it would be a, an absolute uh, madness of, of, of indecision and, and certainty mixed up. Oh, I want toast today. No, I didn't want toast. I wanted bacon. No, no, no. Where's the eggs? You know, it's that sort of thing. Because it's in his nature. He's always been that sort of, of manager. He's never been satisfied. He never will be satisfied. You know, he was successful at Juventus and blew it up. He did well at Italy and blew things up. He did well at Chelsea and tried to blow it. it it's, it's what he does. It's in his nature. He's never satisfied. Um, and that can be really beneficial in that he's constantly driving players yeah. on. It, it can also go the other way. That he just drains them because he's so demanding and so uh, inconsistent in terms of, uh, of his approach. You know, this time last season, we were getting into that period where uh, there were some really good results, a terrible result at Burnley when it looked as though he's going to walk then and everything transformed. So it is, it's, it does feel like here we go again in some ways. It just it started a little bit earlier. Martin, personally, I'm a huge Antonio Conte uh, fan. Are you? I want him to stay as manager, but I'm not sure he does. I think he's an outstanding manager. No question of that. I think he's he he thinks things through on, in terms of the way he wants to play play matches. But at the same time, I've been confused this season by some of the matches, some of the approaches he's taken. I understand the rationale. I think a bit of it was he genuinely thought the key to this season was getting through the first half of the season without too much damage being sustained, get through in Europe, be in the mix for the top four. And he achieved that unquestionably. Uh, but there have been far too few performances where you thought that was Spurs today. We've had 20 minutes here, half hour there, even 45 minutes occasionally. But inconsistently, not enough of it. And, you know, it's rare for a, a team that, a Conte team that are normally very well drilled to be as haphazard at the back of, of Spurs have been and given away so many, not just goals, but given ourselves so many mountains to climb. Uh, and it's a testament, I guess, to the players that they've got their, their boots and axes out to actually climb a lot of those mountains. But you can't keep on doing it. You are going to fall off at some point. Are, are, are you being entertained enough by a Conte style of football? I'm entertained by any team that wins. That, you know, I don't... I, if you if you offered me a series of one nil wins with one shot, I'd, I'd actually take it. Because football at the end of the day is about winning. If you haven't won a trophy for a long time, you just want to win one. If you haven't won matches for a long time, you just want to start winning some. And then yeah. you can start talking about the style. I also think that we saw at the end of last season, when he had his full team available... There, there was a style, there was a certainty, there was a confidence through the team. And you have to look at the games this season. I reckon he's had his first choice team fully available three times, four times over the course yeah. of the first four months of the season. Now, you can't, oh, well, he's only missing one or two and injuries. Yes, that's true. But when you've only got faith in 13, 14 players, which appears to be the case, it may have not be as many as that. If eight, nine percent of those are missing, up to 25 percent of those are missing, you're going to have a, a drop off in results and performances. So I think all of that is is part of it, certainly. 
Martin, what's your gut feeling about Conte's future at Spurs? Do you think he will be manager beyond this season? I don't actually, Chris. And I hope I'm wrong. I think I think he's looking out. And I, look, I really, really want to be wrong. It's not because I want him to go. I don't. I just, as I've said many times, I very rarely ask for managers to lose their job at Tottenham. The exception was Nuno Espirito Santos. It was so far out of his depth, it was frightening from minute yep. one of day one. Um, Conte is not out of his depth. The danger is, I think, actually, that Conte doesn't think the water's deep enough for him and he wants deeper water. And yet, I think if he were to turn things around and start to win things at Tottenham, it would be one of the great triumphs of his career. I think that if he stays for three years from this three and a half years from now, so we're talking about to the summer of 26, there will be silverware on the sideboard. There will be a club that's proven itself to be in the top six or seven in Europe. But I, if I'm being honest, I don't think he'll be here on August the 1st. What keeps Antonio Conte at the club? Is it about this January transfer window? Is it? I is, think that is, would is, yeah. I do think that he needs to be given the players, plural, he wants, which will be two or three. I don't think you can change five because you can only change three for European squad anyhow. He wants to be given two or three now who are first-teamers, as the two were last January in Bentancur and Kulosevsky. Uh, and he also wants then the promise of two or three more first-team players in the summer. But that's not easy to turn into reality. Who do you get now? And I think that there's always a danger that he might just manufacture in his own head another crisis because that's what he does. So I don't think it's easy for the board to meet his expectations. And the danger is that if he doesn't get what he wants, the negativity he transmits which he can't stop himself uh, doing at times, infiltrates the squad, that they feel that they're not valued as players. And I think that can be a problem. And I think that could be a significant issue. Do you think it's right um, that Antonio Conte is so honest in his press conferences? I'm not sure that it's right, but I wouldn't criticise it either, if that makes some sort of sense. I think sometimes discretion is the better part of valour. You don't need to say everything all the time. But he will say, well, this is what's made me the manager I am, that I say what I think. It's never served me ill before. Why would it serve me ill now? So I reckon recognise that's his way. I, I think sometimes it might be preferable were he to keep some of these negative views and negativity out of the public spotlight. But maybe he needs that as well. He needs to find something to fight against, whether it's real enemies or sometimes perceived enemies. What have you made, though, Martin, of uh, some of Conte's uh, press conferences um, since we've come back from the World Cup? Because, of course, after the Brentford game, he said that we don't need defenders. And don't get me wrong, I'm a huge Antonio Conte fan, but all the fans can see that we need defensive reinforcements in this January transfer window. Conte said that we don't need defenders. And more recently, um, he said that his ambition is to win the Premier League and the Champions League, but his target at Tottenham is different. It's to build a solid foundation at the club and take it in the right direction. Um, I look at that and I, I just feel a little bit dis disappointed because I feel that, you know, when you go from Maurizio Pochettino to Jose Mourinho, I know we won't even mention Nuno, but then to Antonio Conte, if, you know, as, as a Spurs fan, you, you feel that if there's anyone that is going to win a trophy, and, and, and as you rightly said earlier, way, way overdue trophies, if there's anyone who's going to come in, win a trophy, it's got to be Antonio Conte. Well, you would think so. Uh, he's, a, he's a strange fish, isn't he? I mean, this is, this is it, really. You see that. He agonises so much. Um, can't be good for his heart. Crikey, it's not good for ours. So what's it like for his? I don't know. Uh, it is a, a bizarre way of, of dealing with things. You would have thought he would, you would, you know, actively try to avoid stress. He seems to want stress, and I, and I, it's obviously the thing that motivates him and has done through his career. I think there seems to be an inconsistency, as there was last season, in some of the things he says. So he reacts 
more to results than fans do. And we're all fans are always accused of being, you know, too result oriented. And oh god, they're brilliant when they win and they're terrible when they lose. And actually, it's somewhere in between. Well, he seems to encapsulate that, if that even be more up and down than the fans are. And I don't necessarily think that's particularly needed or necessary, but for, for the players. The reality is you look at the top, the big six plus Newcastle and Spurs haven't got the strength in depth of some of those clubs. But if you put out your, the best Tottenham team looking yeah. across that squad, there'd be one or two shaky positions, both two of them at centre-half, I guess you'd argue. But other than that, it's a very competitive team. I suppose he would say, well, yeah, but what happens when Romero's injured, as he's been for too much of his time at Tottenham? What happens when Ben Tanker, ben Tanker is injured and I, I'm struggling for to find the body alongside Hoberg, who's done, I think, actually really well this season? What? Who have I really got I can trust elsewhere in the uh, defence? What do I do for goals when Son, as it's been all season, would struggle to hit the target with a very large piece of shooting equipment? You know, I mean, he had a very... Someone who was scoring goals for fun last season, and particularly second half of the season, has had no joy at all apart from two halves in the in the first half of the season. You know, 25 minutes or so against Leicester and then the first half against against Frankfurt were basically the sum total of his contribution. What I would say is when he scored the goal on, on Wednesday night, you could see the wave of angst just disappearing yeah. off his shoulders. It was almost as if it was a different player. And let's hope that that's what it was, that that one goal via a deflection when the shot might not have been going in, maybe what's needed to unlock, we'll know in two or three weeks' time, won't we? You know, if Son starts looking like Son again, with Kane staying fit and Kuliseski being back and Benton curled back and a fit Romero, it looks a very different story, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have had a lot of injury problems and uh, I was in the away end uh, the Palace game and Hun Min Son, you know, right at the end of the game, the, the fans were singing his name. He was so grateful and it just meant the world to him, you, as, as you say, Martin. Um, now, let's let's go on to the January transfer window. Um, what is realistic for Tottenham in well, this well, window? The, I mean, given that UEFA rules say you can only change three players, then there's not much point unless you're buying players who you don't want to play in Europe and then why buy the players? to get in more than three. Uh, but of course, you've also got to get out three to do that. Now, I think an upgrade at right wing back is is obvious and necessary. Um, Emerson Royale is not a bad defender, but he gets a nosebleed when he sees the halfway line, let alone when he crosses it. That's just what we've seen all season. Um, Doherty, to be fair, I think has played well when he was much more advanced in the second half on, on Wednesday. And, his injury has actually been quite uh, a blow, I think, this season. He's not played enough. And when he has played, I think he's a decent, a better player there now. Almost as if he's a player we thought we were signing from Wolves two or three years ago, which we hadn't seen for quite some time until maybe this time-ish last season when he started to look decent, didn't he, uh, in a couple of games. And Spence yeah. has not, not had a chance. He obviously doesn't fancy him. Uh, you know, get him out on loan to play some football. That creates a space in the in the squad. I think you need to get rid of Sanchez and replace him. That's the start. And I'm not sure, I'm afraid that Oliver Skip's going to be a player. I'm not sure that Lucas Moura has got any Spurs future. I'm not sure that Hill has got much of a future. You know, get some of those out to create space. So I would think right back, centre half, and I'd love to see a 10, but a 10 doesn't fit into a Conti system. So another attacking option uh, are, are prerequisites for Spurs to, to make an impact in the second half of the season. I was going to ask that question, Martin, because the amount of Spurs fans you see, particularly on social media, say about we need a creative player. If you bring in a creative player, where does he actually fit into this system uh, for Conte? 
I think it's difficult because he's wedded to a back three. Um, now, you can do it if you play a, a three, four, one, two, perhaps. Uh, but then you'd have to play Kudaseski at right wing back, I guess, if you want him in the team, because you then play, unless you leave out Son. So it's about finding, it is difficult then. I think that, that theoretically works. Um, but then you really are reliant on the wing backs being aggressively attack minded, uh, which could leave you open at the other end. So it's, it is a, a balancing act, isn't it, in, in that regard? Look, I, I really like Madison. I think he's a really good player. Uh, and there's others around and about who you could go and try and find to play in that role. Um, but I'm not sure that Conte really wants to play someone there. And you can't say to him, go and buy a player who doesn't fit his jigsaw. If you don't like the jigsaw, that's tough. He's the manager. You've got to play with his jigsaw. Do you think there's any chance of a, a statement signing coming in in this window? I just want players who play and are good enough. I don't really care. You, you're not going to get, as a rule, top, your first choice player for the season in January, unless yes. something remarkable has happened. So you've got to be really... No, you can get really good players, as was proven last last January. I mean, both Bentancur and Kulisewski have proven without question that they've enhanced the team significantly. You know, they were they were 20% of the team, but they were 35% of the impact. I mean, they really were big, big yeah. players. And, have, you know, the disappointment for the, this season is how little we've seen of Kulisewski. And that's not his fault. I mean, injuries happen to footballers. Um, Bentancur has played most of the games until, until he got that injury in the World Cup. Let's hope he's back soon. But you want to get a starting right wing back who can actually attack and has defensive nous if you're not going to trust um, Doherty to play there because you can't ask uh, Emerson to be something that he isn't. He's what he is. And he's, you know, if you're playing a defensive game away to Liverpool, you might want to put Ever uh, Emerson in. I wouldn't yeah. say that's a terrible thing at all because at least he'll probably bottle up that flank. But if you if you're playing at home to Forest or a, 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 maybe a better team than Forest who are going to be really well organised and and deny you space, then that wing back has got to be able to hurt teams. Why do you think Jed Spence hasn't been given an opportunity under Conte? A bit of it is because he came in late very late at the end of the window and Conti likes to play players who he feels he can trust and who know his system. And then the nature of football with so many games in such a const uh, constricted period meant that there wasn't much enough time to train properly, I don't think. And also he probably hasn't impressed enough. You know, whether, whether that be uh, quality, whether that be uh, mentality, whether may not that be experience, I don't know. I'm not close enough to see that. But he's clearly not done enough to persuade Conti to trust him. Now, he had the opportunity to do that in November, December, when they came back from their little two-week break before the World Cup players come came back. And he might have done. We don't know because he was injured again, isn't he? So, what chance, yeah. you know, doesn't help himself if he's not available. It does appear that Hill has at least given Conti some thought about whether he can be useful. Now, it may have been that necessity has seen him play, and I'm still unconvinced that he's the long, a long-term answer. I think he's fa physically fragile. But there was a little bit, and I just say a little bit, of, of David Silva in the way he protected the ball. The other, and I'm not saying before anyone starts that he's as good a player as David Silva. No, that's not what I'm saying. But there yeah. was a little bit of that in the way he played that made you think that perhaps there's more there than I suspected over what I the little I'd seen last season and this up, up to now. Uh, but if Kulisewski is fit tomorrow or next Sunday rather, you know, he ain't going to play. <laughs> not a chance. He'll be on the bench. And I think yeah. one of the issues that's been a real problem is you looked at the, the bench against Aston Villa and thought, who on earth can come on and improve the team as an attacking force? And no, but none of those players could do. Not a single one of them 
you thought would improve the team in an attacking sense. And that was the frustration that they played. We played okay-ish first half, not great, but probably should have been one up. We couldn't respond when things went went wrong. We just played poorly. It happens. But there was no one on the bench who could freshen it up. You know, in the past, you know, there's been uh, Amora to come on just because he's direct. He's not played really all season. Or before yeah. that, Lamella, who could carry the ball and uh, and drag defenders with him and create things and add a bit of the nastiness. He could wind up the opposition. We haven't, there was no one on that bench who you could see impacting the game at all. Unless you were trying to hold, but you know, to hold on to a lead. Do you think uh, by Antonio Conte um, having not signed a new contract yet, and his contract expires in June, um, do you think that if we do get any players in the January transfer window, they would be more like club signings rather than players that he actually wants? Because we've seen and we've heard Antonio Conte say many times about Jed Spence was a club signing and not his signing. Uh, but when the club don't know if he's staying or not, is that going to be a very different January window for us? I think if you're signing in January, you've got to be signing players who you want to play in the team. Yeah, yeah. You don't. You you can buy project players in the summer. There's nothing wrong with that. That's that's you know development players. They they did in fact sign a development left back. They just left him on loan at. Uh, Udinese for next yes. season. Um, they signed last summer, not this summer, last summer, they signed a development player in Saar. Yes. And he's come back and actually didn't look too bad, did he, against against Palace? Yes. What we spent a little bit against a uh, really big, imposing boy. There's no question about that. Let's just see uh, whether he's ready yet. And that's it's unclear on the basis of the limited evidence we've uh, we've had. And likewise, Spence was a, a development signing who stayed at the club. We just haven't seen any signs of development because he's not been on the pitch. So development signings are a summer thing. January, you don't sign development players unless you're literally signing youth team players who are never going to be in the first team, which you can do. That's different because they're not going to be in the 25. You sign players who you actually think are going to be in the team, not in the squad, in the team. You've got There's no point in signing the, the a, a fifth striker or a third choice left back. You Got to sign players who are going to go into the first team. Would you expect Jed Spence to go out on loan in this window? It depends on whether they can shift anybody else. So if Emerson leaves, then you keep Spence as third right wing back because you wouldn't let Emerson go unless you're bringing somebody else in. But if they keep Emerson and bring someone in, then Spence on loan makes sense because there's no point. He's not going to get a kick. So let's get him out playing football. Uh, and then bring him back in the summer to work with whoever the new manager or whoever the manager is in the summer. If it's Conte, then fine. Um, he's still a young boy. He's still a long way to go. We saw signs that you know, what he could do last season uh, at Forest. So, you know, there's a talent there. Uh, yeah. But it's very different to play in the Championship and the old FA Cup game to playing in the Premier League and in, in the Champions League. It, it, it is a huge step up and many have taken... A while to, to to take it, so we shouldn't be too negative on that. You know, I'm, I'm more frustrated. I've got to be honest with the lack of development in Ryan Sessegnon. Yeah, he's been at the club for a long time now, and he's made about as much impact as I have on the team. I'm afraid. Uh, you know, he, he, one one goal to start this season, one goal against Bayern Munich three years ago. He doesn't seem to have improved at all, does he? I was going to come on to that, Martin, because as we all know, um, Antonio Conte's system is absolutely reliant on good wing backs. Now, uh, don't get me wrong. I think that the summer window was good. I felt that we could have done with a, a few more players. And I was absolutely uh, you know, really surprised the fact that we didn't go out and sign a proven right wing back that walked straight into the team. Yes, we signed Jed Spence, uh, which was a club signing, not Antonio Conte signing, as we've heard many times. But... Would you be surprised if we get to the end of this January window that we haven't improved in that position? If we don't sign a right wing back in January, I don't think we'll have a conscious manager at the end of January. I think this. I think the one thing he'll demand is an upgrade there. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, I might be entirely wrong. I've, this could be complete nonsense. I might be, you know, and I might utterly misjudge. And he might think that Doherty and Royal and Spence are the answer, but I don't believe he does. Yeah. Um, and you, at the moment, we're, you know, Perisic has actually done more than well enough. I think, you know, given that he's an experienced yeah. player, his delivery is excellent. He's got a lot of goals through his set piece delivery. Through his and he can cross a ball and created chances. So I think yes. that's that's been that's been okay. I mean, I wouldn't say he's the long term answer because he can't be at his age. But he's more than a short term fix. You get this season and next season out of him. You may start to if you can find an alternative, maybe Udogi, maybe somebody else. You might sort of just slightly look to ease him out next season. But you certainly wouldn't be unhappy having him in the squad. But there is no penetration really. Oh, not enough on the right. Now, to be fair, I think Doherty at times has shown he can do that. You know, the the second goal, not the goal he scored so much on on Wednesday, but the second goal came from the run he's made from right wing back to centre forward, because yeah. there wasn't a foul, but the ball broke, and there there was then there was space created. His run created the space out wide for uh, the Son, so the Kane uh, Hill link up. So. More of that, there may be, and I don't. As I say, at times he's actually looked quite decent, uh, but you can't play him every game, so you've got to have someone else who can actually hurt teams, and that's an obvious. If he doesn't trust Spence, we know that Royal can't hurt teams. You've got to go and buy someone who can. It's a must. It has to be. Um, Pedro well, we've been Poro. That for three years, haven't we? Exactly. Exactly. Um, I, ca I cannot believe is, under the I mean, management of Antonio Conte that we don't have one. Yeah. You know, it's, it, you can argue, since, I mean, Trippier is a, a right back who can deliver yeah. uh, and fell out with the manager, unfortunately. But, you know, certainly since he went, we've had a huge void in that position. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Martin, I was going to ask about Pedro Poro. He keeps being linked uh, to a move to Spurs. Fabrizio Romano said today, that a deal will be difficult in this window, but Spurs may visit it uh, and pay the release clause in the summer. Um, now, what you've just said there, if Spurs don't get a right wing back, Antonio Conte may go. Um, what do you make of this situation if if we don't get a right wing back? Surely it's, it's an absolute must. And when you look at the fixtures coming up, you know, you look at other teams doing business early in the January window. Now, go back to last January, Benton Kerr and Kulisewski coming in on deadline day, the 31st of January. Um, why do you think Spurs don't seem to get business done early? Because <laughs> they never do. <laughs> why, it's, why? Like, it's an article of faith almost. Look, the truth is that, that the board, Daniel in particular, doesn't want to overpay for players because he, when he has in the past, he's been burned. You know, they overpay for Ndombele who we all thought was going to be a real player, and he's an utter disappointment. He overpaid for Lo Celso, who we all thought would be a good player, was an utter disappointment. So when you've been burnt, you're going to be a bit more reticent. And I, and I get that. And I don't... And also, you know you play hardball with the Portuguese. Whatever the player is, they, what they say they want and what they'll actually accept are vastly different numbers. That's, and there's nothing wrong with them playing hardball. That's how a lot of these clubs, Porto and Benfica in particular, have made themselves into viable businesses. They hold out till the last minute before they do a deal. And you've got to accept that if you, you, it's very hard to get them to agree early because you know that they're, off, they want, they're asking for a price which is 15 to 20% more than they're going to accept. Yeah. You've just got to wait it out. So I get that. What it, for the sake of two weeks, is it worth paying ten million pounds more than you should? Than you're going to have to. And I understand that the you know the logic, the business logic is no. And it's understandable. Well, it, but, it could be it could be the difference of Champions League football, Europa League football, Europa Conference League football, absolutely. or no European football therein, at all. Therein, therein lies the dilemma for the board, and always has and always will. But I, I, I just sometimes feel it would be good to just do a deal that no one knew about and get it over the line and produce the player, and then it frees up. Then you can say, well, we've, got, that's, we've done our money. 
you know, it's one of those things that then people start, oh, well, they're not going to spend that much, are they? So what, what's the realistic price for the other player? Just, it wouldn't be, but it's not that easy, clearly, because everyone's aware that this is a, a, a seller's market in in January, even though the only, you know, outside of England, there's probably five clubs with money. You know, Bayern Munich are hunting around trying to find a goalkeeper and have just taken Daily Blint for free. It's Bayern Munich. You know, they're yeah. the wealthiest club in Germany by one of the top seven wealthiest clubs in the in the world. And they're doing yeah. free deals. You know, it's only really the English clubs, PSG, Real Madrid and Barcelona, who've got the big bucks. But what the other cl clubs will do is play them off against each other. You know, Chelsea, uh, Benfica are, are off asking for 127 million euros for Fernandes. Now, they're not going to end up accepting that, but that's what they're going to hold up to, to force Chelsea to pay 110 million euros. This is what the game is. You know, we've now got Shakhtar Donetsk playing that game with Chelsea and Arsenal. For Mudrich, I mean, it, it happens everywhere. Um, Atalanta are going to do it for Malinowski. They're going to try and, you know, they're not going to settle early in case they can get more money from another English club which is willing to spend. And, you know, a lot of these clubs think of the English clubs as idiots because they'll pay anything for players. Malinowski seems to be a very versatile player. Uh, that could fit into Antonio Conte's system. What's the chances of that deal getting done? I don't know. Um, I think it probably means getting rid of Moura first, get him out of the squad, or get Hill out on loan, because you've got to create the vacancy in the in the squad. Now, maybe you don't have to do it first. You have to do that. That's going to be part of it. Atalanta don't need to sell, but. He, they can't offer him Champions League football, it appears, next season, the way they're going. They lost again, didn't they, on the first weekend, or first set of fixtures back. The best they're going to offer them, potentially, is Conference League football, the way it's going. Maybe not even that. So he's going to want to go. The issue then is, do they sell? Do they want to sell now? Or do they want to hold on to it and believe they can create a bigger market in, in the summer? Now, you'd probably argue that, actually, you're going to get higher price for a player now out of, because teams are, are really keen and desperate than in the summer when they can have their choice of players from across Europe. So that's an issue for, for Atalanta to, to sort out, I think, as well. I think he could be, a, from what I've seen of him, he could be quite useful. Uh, and he would give us the option to play, you know, when Vachalison gets fit. Remember him, we had him, uh, 60 million quid, hasn't scored a goal yet, but looks like he can play a bit. Get him fit. Then you don't have to play Song, Kane, and, and Kulisewski every minute of every every game as well. You've got some options. You can play rotate three from five. At the moment, we're rotating two from two. You've got no option about who you're going to play up front. Where 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 Malinowski is twenty nine uh, though, Martin, and and he's a he's like a ready made player to walk into this team or be a, a great part of the squad. Uh, you know, players like Antonio Conte wants you know ready made players. Does that type of signing, though, um, fit what the Spurs board want? Because it's always about bringing in players for the future. I think sometimes you've got to take a short-term hit. I mean, they did it to a degree with Perisic, um, but it wasn't very expensive. I think you've occasionally got to be willing to take a, a short-term view rather than a medium to long-term view. But not all the time, because you, if you do that, you go bankrupt. So you've got to have a mix of that. Uh, if if Conte was to say to them, right, I want you to go and get this right back and this bloke from Atalanta, and that's all I want, but just get me them, I'd be tempted to say, OK, we'll go and get them then. But it also probably, yeah, but I also want this and I could do with that. and I can. Yeah. So he, he doesn't make it easy for anyone. I'd like to see a bit more decisive action. But it's easy for me to say that because it's not my, my money I'm spending. It really isn't. I can I can spend other people's money brilliantly. I'm not so good at spending my own. I, I think, though, if you asked every Spurs fan who watches the team week in, week out, we would all say the same thing. We need a centre-back and we need a right wing-back. Would you agree? Yeah, those are the two obvious a a areas, I would say. But I think they need to have one more attacking option who you can really trust. Uh, but I think, yeah, centre-half is, is huge. Preferably a left-sided centre-half, but 
a centre half, uh, a dominant physical central defender. Because Romero, when he's on the pitch, although he's not been as good this season, apart from when he's been wearing blue and white stripes, um, he's clearly a physical dominant centre centre half. You have two of those plus one other who can pick up the pieces, then you've got the stability, which also makes your wing-backs be more confident in playing further forward because they know with the screening in midfield that you're not going to get outnumbered. So it, the stability breeds confidence, makes you more of an attacking threat anyhow. Martin, a lot of fans have been asking uh, the question recently about um, budgets in the January window and, and where the rest of the money went. Um, do you have any idea of what budget Spurs have for this window no. in particular? No, I, I, I don't. And I don't think anyone outside of, of Daniel's inner circle do. Um, I am not one of the, I wouldn't say agitators, that's not the right word. I'm not an anti with, with Enoch and Levy. I, I, I'm not. I recognise the frustrations of the fans who are. I share a lot of those frustrations, but that's because I'm a fan who's always going to be frustrated. But I also recognise the stability of the model that's been been built over a number of years. The one thing you know is that they will not want to imperil the future of the club. I just do sometimes think that there's an, an innate caution that adds to the sense of, I wouldn't say inertia, but a sense that there's a real, there's a lack of conviction sometimes in what they're looking to do. That it's a bit about managing rather than achieving. And I know that's not the the thought of the of the board. I know that, that you know, from my conversation with people, they desperately want to win things. Yeah. But I understand why many would think actually they don't. I'm not sure they're. I think they're wrong in that view. Because I do believe they do want to to win things, but at the same time, I can understand why people are uncertain about the real ambition of of the club. If I was to ask you, Martin, how many players do you think Conte is going to get in this January window? Two, but don't okay. don't quote me on that. <laughs> because it could, you know, at Spurs, it could be none, it could be one. They could go silly and buy five. I don't think they will, but I think it will get two in, like he did last last January. If he gets two of the first-teamers who are upgrades on what we have and everyone else stays relatively fit and available, you'd feel very differently about the second half of the season, wouldn't you? You really yeah. would. Particularly if Song can be son again if we get the son if we get the son of the second half of last season back and Kane stays fit and Kulisevsky's fit and Richarlison comes back with a you know with and plays like he did for Brazil and I, you know he's not quite done enough yet but you can see the player that, that's there you think well there's a lot of goals in that team just with those and then hang on they're strengthening mid centre half and they've got a better right wing back oh blimey they've got they've got half a chance of finishing Second, third, and maybe go deep in, in the Champions League. Martin, it's, it's, it's a weird one, this, because um, on Wednesday against Palace, um, as you've already mentioned, Saar and Brian Hill had good games. Um, now, and also, as you mentioned, you know, for, for spaces within the squad, do Spurs now replace these players and put these two players out on loan? Or because they've had... Uh, involvement in the first team in the last couple of weeks. Does Antonio Conte now work with them? And, you know, Wednesday evening after the game, the Spurs fans were singing uh, Brian Hill's name. Will that now disappoint the fans if he did go out on loan? I, I, it's very hard to make judgments on the basis of fleeting appearances. What would they have said on Sunday night if about Hill going out on loan? You know, what a difference is, a few days makes. Yeah, exactly. Now, it may be that he needed that game to be, you know, a couple of starts. I mean, he came on against Frankfurt, didn't he, and played pretty well a um, couple of uh, three months ago, whatever it was, so long ago now, with this bizarre break that we had for the World Cup. Um, yeah. So, 
I'm still unconvinced that he always got a long-term future at Spurs. I would love to be proven wrong, but I'm unconvinced. I think Saar, physically at least, you look at him and think, yeah, he, he's, there, there could be something there. You know, crikey, I'm going to be let down by Basima this season. Let's be honest. He was yeah. going to be the enforcer in midfield. And I, when they signed Basuma, I assumed the midfield two would be Basuma and Ben Tancur and that Hoberg may well be on his way by January. Well, you wouldn't imagine letting Hoberg go. He's been absolutely a standout player in the, in the team this season. He's been yeah. excellent. Uh, even more so because he's not only he rest, he's played every game virtually. And when he wasn't playing against was it Forest, we really missed him. Um, he's been been huge, and you wouldn't have seen that coming if we're being brutally honest. I don't think so. If he looks, if if Conte looks at Saar and sees that he's better in his mind than Skip, and that perhaps there's a better player there than the Bissouma we've seen then you'd probably look to send Skip out rather than, than Saar. If you think that Saar needs to play another five months for real development and he's not going to play much this season at Spurs because of this, you've got faith in Bissouma and Bantancourt and Hoberg, then you might as well let him go on loan for the long-term good. So I think it's a difficult difficult one but that's for the manager to decide rather than, than me he knows he should know more about Sana because he's had that extra time working with him in that two three weeks between the the return of the majority of the players and the restart of the league Martin the last January transfer window turned out to be a great one because of course we went from Europa Conference League football to playing Champions League football you know they were um they were fantastic signings um they signed on the 31st of January, uh, which seemed to come out of nowhere, really. You, you, they weren't names that were cropping up in the first three weeks of the window. Do you think that's going to be the same this window where if we do make signings, they will be literally last minute? I do think that frequently past behaviour is a pretty good guide to future behaviour. Uh, that being the case, then, yeah. <laughs> Lastminute.com again, as it's the nature of things, as has been the case for a decade or more. Occasionally they go early, but you know, quite often as well, the la the latter signings have been good signings. Yeah, you know, we go back to um, yeah. you know, Defoe uh was relatively late, wasn't he? And uh, and Dawson and and others as well. And they don't all work, but quite a lot of the late ones have have worked over the over the years, um, and let's just let's just see. I, but I would I would imagine, given what we know and what we've seen, that Spurs will be busier in the last forty-eight hours of the window in terms of both ins and outs than they are in the first twenty-nine days. I'm not seeing Fabio on the phone very much at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> He, he, you know, he's, he's got issues in, in chewing to worry about a little bit as well, hasn't he? Um, that would yeah. be down the line. And maybe that would be a concern, I think, for Spurs in two or three years' time, given the, the slow wheels of Italian justice. If there's anything that there to be uh, to be investigated, we don't know that yet. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like there's an awful lot of, of eagerness to be really busy at the moment. But, of course, this call could be a front behind the scenes. It could be like, a, you know, it looked like a serene... Uh, bird the duck underneath it's scrabbling maybe they're scrabbling behind the scenes we'll we'll find out soon enough Martin with the positions that we've discussed centre back uh, right wing back and a creative player any names that you can give us that Spurs are interested in and uh, as I mentioned Pedro Poro earlier if Spurs were to sign him in this window or in the summer um, is he the right fit I can't give any names because I don't know any. I'm literally back after three weeks off, so I'm being honest here. And I've actually tried to switch off other than watching the games because um, that's been hard enough. Um, I can't say I know whether Poro is good enough because I, I saw him a couple of times in the Champions League, once in the flesh and once on telly. Yeah. I haven't seen enough. I don't know. But if you'd asked me this time last year if Ben Tancur and Kulisewski were good enough, I would have said... Hmm, well, he's not wanted by Juventus. I'm not quite sure. And Kulisewski's been around for a bit and he hasn't really done much and he looks a bit gangly and he looks 
looks a bit immature. And oh my word, he's a player, isn't he? So you just don't know, do you? It's like well, well, do you know? Um, last January window, just before we signed Benson Kerr and Kulisewski, I had a, a journalist from Uruguay and a journalist from Italy on, and I said, please give me your opinions on these players. I'm all upbeat and saying we're about to sign these two players, and they both come on and said, no, they're terrible. They're absolutely terrible. They're no better than Harry Winks. They lose the ball all the time. Kulisewski can't cross. He can't do this. Can't... And my face just was an absolute picture. And, and of course, look how, look how well it's turned out. You just don't know. And sometimes signings that you think are really going to be brilliant turn out to be disasters. And others you're thinking, oh, God, turn out to be really good. Now, I, I have to say, I was, I, I looked at the signings last January and thought, well, I don't know, but they seem to be players who are at least better than what we've got or as good, you know, m- might make a difference. And both of them made a huge difference. There's no doubt about it. And you know that by the songs. You know, the, the fans recognised that pretty early on, that there was something really yeah. beneficial from those two. Uh, and because, I mean, Kudoseski's strength is that he stretches the pitch, creates so much more space for Son and Kane. Just because he's going to hug that touchline, you can't let him go because he's going to hurt you. He can cut inside and he'll kill you. He'll go around the outside and pull back. So he gives you extra threat which means that Son and Kane are better players because they've got a little bit more space. Not that Harry needs too much anyhow, as we know. And I think that Kudoseski was a massive factor in the goal Son scored um, last season because he created a different pitch for, for Tottenham to play in. And Ben Tanker, without question, I mean, he scored big goals this season. He's a, he's a big lad, isn't he? But he's not, and he's not scared. If he gets, he will jump in the middle of a box and out jump a centre half and indeed out jump a goalkeeper. That's a huge thing to have. And he's scored in vital goals for us this season already. So him coming back hopefully soon again. Um, and if just if if the, if you get two in who make 85% of their impact, that's gonna make a massive difference. But previous January signings have been, let's be honest. Less successful, some of them. So you don't know. You can't ever tell. I was uh, going to say that. I, I, I know I said to you about a statement signing and, uh, you know, spending big. But it don't necessarily work out all of the time because, you know, you look at Ondon Bell and La Celso, £100 million between the two of them. And then you see what good deals they did in January. Kulisewski and Benton Kerr, you know, didn't cost that much money uh, and, and, and such an impact. Um, Martin, I uh, want to come on to talk about Harry Kane. Of course, he's out of contract in 2024. Um, any news on Harry Kane possibly signing a new contract? What's your uh, feeling on this one? Look, there's no doubt that the board are desperate for him to sign on. I think a lot of the conversation will be nowhere else will you find the love that you have here. Nowhere else will you be as at home as you are here. And if you stay, we are going to win things. You want to be part of it. The one thing you need in your mind is silverware. But it would mean more if you do it at this club because of what you've given to this club and what this club has given to you. And there'll be yeah. some emotional back, uh, blackmail going on there. You know, I absolutely get where Kane was at the start of last season. And I say to me, it wasn't that Kane wanted to leave as much as he felt he couldn't stay. And I absolutely got that. And I understood where he was coming from. And whilst it would have been devastating for me as a Tottenham supporter to see him leave the club, I would not have begrudged him. But we're 18 months further on now. And City have got the cane they were looking for. They've got Holland. So where's he going to go that's going to be absolutely, unquestionably better than what he's got at Tottenham? knowing that his goal, one of his goals, one of his focuses is to beat Shearer's record of Premier League goals, which means 62 more goals, 63 more goals to beat the record. So he's got to stay in the Premier League to beat the Premier League record and he can't go to City because they've got Haaland. So where does he go? He's not going to go to Chelsea. He's not going to go to Arsenal. He's never shown any interest in going to United before. He's not going to go to Liverpool because of the way they treat him. Is he really going to go to Newcastle? I don't think so. Why? Well, it's a blooming long way from London, isn't it? And he's a Londoner. And, you know, I mean, Robert Lee went there all those years ago because he was kidded that it was further further, further south than Middlesbrough. <laughs> By Keegan. It wasn't, obviously. But then that's what he told him. And Robert didn't quite work it out. Um, 
So I think it's, you know, look, if, if Spurs are eighth and Newcastle come second, then next, at the end of next season, then, then maybe. Um, and if it gets to the end of the contract and he hasn't signed a new one, that's interesting. I think it, a decision has to be made in the summer by him and the club where it's going to go. Yeah. And they will be working really hard to get him to sign for another three year extension or four year extension to see out his days as a Tottenham Hotspur player. I think we, we can all expect at some point in the future Harry Kane will be manager of Tottenham Hotspur if he wants to get into management. It's a it's a certainty now, isn't it? In the same way that Hoddle had to come back and be manager of Spurs at some point. Harry Kane as manager of Tottenham is as inevitable as as um Lampard going to be manager at Chelsea. At some point, John Terry being manager of Chelsea. Stephen Gerrard, even though he's going to hate every minute of it, being manager of, of Liverpool. Doesn't mean to be successful, but it's inevitable. It's part of the destiny. So yeah. whatever happens, Kane's Tottenham career will continue and return. Um, but the club have also got to make it right for him to want to stay, to want to commit. You know, wh why should he throw away the last five years of his career for a club that's ambitions are actually to come eighth. And I, you know, you, you couldn't be grudging him, as I said, 18 months ago, if he were to take a, a different view. But I think that the board will do everything in their power to get him to stay. They know what it would mean, what it would say to the fans if he went away and started scoring goals for somebody else. Every goal he scored in another shirt would be a dagger through the heart of the fans and increase the vitriol towards the board. That's just what happens. And so I think that every stop will be put out to keep him at the club. There'll be nothing that the club won't do to try and persuade him to sign on, to recommit. I think it'll probably be easier for him to leave, though, Martin, knowing that he's got that record at Spurs, which is only two away from Jimmy Greaves. And as you mentioned, 62 away from Alan Shearer's record. Uh, time with Wayne Rooney uh, for England. Do you think that he is the best striker that you've ever seen? Is he is Harry Kane better than Jimmy Greaves? I never saw Jimmy Greaves, so I can't say. I can't say. I don't think he's, he's, he's not the same player. He's much more of a Shearer type striker than a Greaves striker. You know, Greaves played off Smith. Smith's got 208 goals. He wasn't bad. He yeah. was, you know, I mean, he's yeah. a, a terrific striker. You know, in the same way, I started watching Spurs when Chivers played up front uh, in the early 70s. And there are parallels as well. Strong, powerful, good in the air, two-footed. Uh, Harry's a bit more two-footed than Martin. Uh, not blistering pace, but good enough pace imagination in the box, all of those things. Not they are similar, there are similarities definitely in those those two players. Um I also obviously had the pleasure of watching Lineker um and Klinsman and Sheringham. Harry Kane's probably the best and I, I grew up worshiping Glenn Hoddle. I thought he was the best player I'd ever seen. I would so say, say now Harry Kane is the greatest player in Tottenham history. Maybe not the best player, but the most. He's carried more of a burden for the club than any other player in the history of the club. And he's done it with uh, a consistent excellence, which defies expectation on any player, because he's carried this club for seven, eight years now. And he's had good players around him, but he's been the one consistent, solid factor. And even when Spurs are playing badly, even when he's not fully fit, there's nobody you want the chance to fall to more than Harry Kane. Yeah. And that's, that's it. And that's basic. And he's why he scored so many goals, all sorts of goals. And I think that the real value of Harry Kane to the club will only be recognised and realised, much as people venerate him now, will only be realised and recognised when he leaves, when he retires, when he's gone elsewhere. Because that hole will not be filled for 20 years. He needs a trophy though, Martin. 100%. Oh, he, and he, needs, yeah. he deserves one. He's been brilliant. And that's yeah. why if he'd gone to City, I wouldn't have begrudged it at all. Yeah. Because I think he deserves to end his career with some physical 
proof of what he had. You know, records are great and he lived for goals. Yeah. But he wants to be able to point to say, I won that. No, he'd love to win it. If he, if he wins that with England, it's easier. If England, if he'd won the, the Euros 18 months ago, it would have all been a lot easier. Mm. Um, if he'd won the World Cup, you know, last month, it would have been a lot easier. But but he didn't. Yeah. And he still wants to win. And you can't blame him. Why should you blame him? How can you blame him for wanting to win something? That's what that's what it's all about. It's about glory. Yeah, it's about winning too. Because winning Absolutely. is glory. Well, another player that hasn't won a trophy at Spurs in his 10 years, Hugo Lloris. Um, what, what do you make of this Hugo Lloris situation? Because, of course... Uh, you know, last weekend made a mistake, another mistake this season against Aston Villa, led to their first goal. Uh, he then made a couple of great saves in the Crystal Palace game. What have you made of his 10 years at Spurs? And, uh, you know, he's out of contract in 2024. Um, wouldn't it just be so bad that he leaves the club after 10, 11 years without winning a trophy? Oh, yeah. He deserves to win. He's been great. He's been a fantastic goalkeeper. You know, he, he had no connection with the club before he joined and yet he's now indelibly linked you know he, uh, there are two clubs that you will think of when it comes to Lewis that's Leon and Spurs that's it and probably now because he's been at Spurs for so long it'd be Spurs first rather than Leon uh, and he's had a terrific career at, at Tottenham he's been he's been part of a very very good Tottenham team that's just fallen short and they didn't fall short because of him they feel short for other reasons, sometimes mentality, sometimes bad luck, because that's football. Um, and yes, he does make mistakes. Every goalkeeper makes mistakes. The best goalkeepers are the ones who don't worry about the mistakes because they, they think in their head, it's be a long time till the next one. And that's what Luis does. He does. If he makes a rick, he thinks it's six weeks till the next one. That mentality is really, really good. Um, yeah, he, he, what's he made this year? Three or four? You forget the saves he made at one point and one game. His distribution yep. isn't great. We know that. So, OK, don't ask him to play long. Oh, or accept that when he plays long, it's gonna it's, the ball might go out of play. Don't worry about it. Accept the, the, the limitations and accentuate the positives. He's made more saves than most goalkeepers. Over the years, his stats are incredibly high comparatively and maybe he's not in the top three or four keepers in the Premier League anymore he's certainly in the top 10 if not top six who would you have ahead of him yeah you'd probably have Allison. you'd have Edison maybe you'd have Ramsdale I'm not entirely sure you wouldn't have Kepa ahead of him you wouldn't necessarily have have too many others maybe Pope but Pope can't kick a ball either well, there's been lots of reports stating that Spurs are interested in Jordan Pickford. Any truth in that that you've heard, or, or would, would you? What would you think of that if, if if he came in? Look, I think Pickford has actually been a pretty good goalkeeper. Though one of the reasons he's looked a bit ropey at Everton is because he's at Everton, oh, and he's it's been tough, and he's in playing behind a defence with whom he's had no confidence whatsoever. It's interesting at the start of this season when they were defending well. I went to see a couple of games and he was he played at Fulham and also at, at Brentford. He was absolutely outstanding because he had a bit more faith in the defence, even though he's actually making as many saves as before, because he thought the defence was going to be was going to bail him out almost. He didn't his confidence was high. He hasn't made a cost a, a mistake that's cost a goal for England in his entire England career because he's played behind a better defence. So he's more confident. So if you have him behind a good defence, I think he's calmed down. He doesn't get as agitated as he used to. He was a bit like Joe Hart in that everything was angst-ridden. Oh, and it's actually not good for you. You need calmness for a goalkeeper. I think he's calmed down. And he's made the odd blunder, because people do. He's not terrible. I think you buy him... Goalkeepers are really in their prime from sort of late 20s into mid-30s. You get a yeah. seven, eight year purple period where they're at their best, where they, they're not worried about mistakes, where they have confidence in themselves, where they know what they can do. They know the limitations. They work really hard. They have to. Uh, and they can have a, a consistency of performance over a number of number of seasons. So he's in that age area as well. He's experienced. Uh, is he, would he be my absolute first choice? No. 
would I be upset if he was signed? No. Yeah. But I think that you, I don't think you're going to sign a first choice goalkeeper until the next uh, summer, because I think Luis will see out his contract. It's interesting. I was on a, a, a panel with Paul Robinson um, just before Christmas, and he was really, really keen on Melier at Leeds. Yeah. Now, obviously, he lives in Leeds. He's seen a lot of people. He, you know, he's worked up there. He thinks he's the real deal. And he thinks that he could come in the summer to be number two and play games next season to take over long term. And obviously, he's much younger. Yeah. Um, he's got athleticism. Uh, he's got decent feet. He looks to have a good mentality. And if you were looking at perhaps uh, the replacement for Lloris to last as long as Lloris, Melier might be a better fit. And if Leeds were to get relegated this season, which is certainly not beyond the bounds of possibility, albeit I think they probably will stay up, then that might be a, a better position or better a better uh, signing to think about from a Spurs perspective. Martin, also want to ask you about the uh, the players currently out on loan: uh, Regulon, Winks, Lo Celso, Roden, and Ondon Bele. What's the chances of Spurs offloading some of these players on a permanent deal in the near future? I think if the offer came in, they get rid of the lot. <laughs> I don't think they've got any future at the club. Uh, I don't think. I mean, I'm done. to be fair, has done quite well for Napoli, but I'd love to look at his minutes played. And I bet he's averaging less than sixty-five. Again, just, just, just before I come on this show with you, um, I noticed online that he, he's had a. A big falling out with the manager. No, so there you go. <laughs> but it's never his fault, is it? Never his fault. It's always somebody else's fault. Yeah. Oh, come on. There comes a point where you've got to take responsibility. So you don't want him back. You don't want to sell so back. You don't. You know, I mean, basically, Regulon, he served his two years. Fine. Get, you know, get if you can get 20 million, 15 million, doesn't matter. Just take the money. Um, I don't it, think it's going to be. It's going to be very difficult to offload some of these players, though, isn't it? On Dombele, because of the way he is. Yeah. Lo Celso has just had surgery out injured. Harry Winks, the same. Uh, Regulon has had a hard 2022 uh, injured most of the time. Joe Roden can't even get into the Ren team at the moment. So how on earth do you offload some of these players? Sometimes you just have to write them off, don't you? You write off the money. You just get what you can get. Um, you know, by this stage in the contracts, their value has been amortised down to little anyhow. It's not a significant impact on, on your balance sheet because you're down to them being valued at five, six million, which in the eternal scheme of things, when you've got an income potentially this year, including Champions League, of 450 to 500 million revenue, Five or six million here or there, also as it sounds, and it, you know, in the real world, it's, it's inconceivable. But in the world of football, just write it off. You just you can, you can do that. Martin, do you have any um, update on the naming rights? Because there's been lots of rumours out in the last what six months or so. Amazon, Google, etc. Uh, of course, Spurs moved in the stadium, uh, having spent time at Wembley back in April 2019. That's coming up to four years and we still don't have a deal in place. Are you surprised? I am. I think that you've got to take COVID into account uh, and that they were hanging out. For, and they're still, they want, they want a front-loaded deal worth between 200 and 250 million, a 20-year deal, but with the money front-loaded, with most of the money up early, which you can understand why, because there's obviously the stadium debt to pay off, and the more of the capital you pay off, uh, the less you have to pay long term, or even if it's only at £17 million a year, as it is at the moment in terms of repayment, you've still got to pay things off. So I, I absolutely understand that. Uh, I would have expected by now for a deal to be done. They've got the commercial officer whose job is to eventually do that deal. Lots of names being mentioned over the past few years. I imagine it, it, at some point, There'll be a given the, the type with the NFL that there will be a, an NFL franchise in London and it will be at Tottenham. And I think that's where you might that's where the real value in the naming rights will be will be seen to be from a US perspective. 
but you can't wait forever. You've got to get someone in soon. So you look at you know, at the, the likes of Nike or Amazon or these huge multinational billion dollar consortia and think that those are the sort of people who you must be targeting. But as yet, clearly, they haven't been able to reach an agreement. I am surprised because I think it's a really saleable commodity. You, yeah. you go to those NFL games and you are transported to the northeast of the USA in, in the fall. It feels like that. You're not in Florida. You're in Buffalo or you're in New York or you're in Boston in terms of the weather and the temperature. But you're definitely not in London. You're in America for those games. And I think, you know, it's a, it's a very different atmosphere for different reasons, but it's a real a real coup to have that that property. And it does surprise me that the, the naming rights deal hasn't yet been done. It can't yeah. last for long, can it? They've got to get something done soon for obvious reasons. It's bonkers. Because also, the, the thing, of course, is once you name a stadium once, that's it. You never, even if you have multiple changes of ownership in the future, the first one is the one that has the impact. That's yeah. the one that gets that gets remembered. And even if you change the sponsor, it doesn't get named that often. What do you, you know? What's the oval called now? What sponsor? What's Headingley's new sponsorship? You can't remember, can you? You know, it's like other football grounds. You don't remember. Often. Well, so, what, what, some next? some of them are change. Some of them are changing like every couple of years, which is is crazy. But you, don't, but you don't get big money for a short-term deal. You've yeah. got to have a long-term deal. So, look, the two other big six clubs with naming rights partners, um, they will always be known by those, those sponsors. Mm. You know, yeah. when Arsenal changed their sponsor of the ground, it's been very hard not to call it the Emirates. It will. It will be mm. instinctive in the same way with when City... If City ever ch ch change ownership, it would be very hard for it to be known as anything other than the Etihad because yeah. that, those are ingrained names. It's the same thing with Tottenham. Whoever the first sponsor sponsor is has got first mover advantage. And that is, that's why they're holding out for the big deal because the second, second and third deals are not going to be worth as much pro yeah. rata in terms of you know, long term. Even if, the, even if the quantum goes up, that's not taking inflation into account. So the big deal has to be the first one. So understandably, you're going to push and push to make sure that first deal, because it's the big one, is as big as you can make it. Martin, also want to talk about the uh, the board. Now, Daniel Levy and the board are, are coming under a lot of criticism from the Spurs fans right now that a number of fans want the board to do more, uh, invest more money and back Antonio Conte. Um, what do you make of this situation? Um, should the board be doing more? It's very easy to, to blame the board for all the ills of the club. Sometimes it's the players, sometimes it's the manager, sometimes it's everyone. Uh, I, as I said earlier, I understand the frustrations because I'm a fan as well. I, I get frustrated. But, and I also understand those who, who say that actually the problem is that it's just an investment vehicle that uh, Uncle Joe and Daniel and the rest of the board are trying to fatten the, 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 the animal so they can make a massive profit because they've spent invested X and they're going to get Y back and they don't really care. I know why people say that. I genuinely don't believe it's true. Yes, at some point, the club, the owners will sell for a spectacular profit. At the same time, training ground, the stadium, the money that's been spent has been astronomical. They funded it, albeit through loans, but it's been funded by the club. And the one way to get more for when you sell is to have a successful club. If you've got a club that's in that's, that's always in the Champions League and always um, knocking on the door and winning trophies, you get more when you sell. So, of course, they want to be successful. There's also a sense, I think, from the club that they don't want to make too many mistakes. People forget very easily the impact of COVID on Tottenham. That this everything has been predicated around this brand new revenue stream 
that was suddenly cut off dead within a few months of moving into the ground, less than a season of moving into the ground. So suddenly there were big, big, the, 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 the outgoings still had to be met and there were no incomings apart from TV. And that, if you remember, went into abeyance for a while as well. And then they had to pay, they got less in because of the rebate. So all of these factors have got to be accepted. At the same time, absolutely get, spend some blinking money because that's what you want as a, as a fan. You want to see ambition, clear ambition on behalf of the club, particularly if some of your rivals are spending money. Now, I think that Chelsea's spending since last summer has been at best scattergun. Yeah. But you can't say they've not spent money because, my word, have they spent money and they are still spending money. And it may be wasted money. Yeah. But Chelsea fans aren't moaning because they're clearly spending money. They then moan about the players they got, but they don't moan about them when they're spending the money. It's only afterwards. And you can't win in that regard. Unless you're winning matches, you're going to call get grief. So it, it isn't an easy one. I think that one of the frustrations is that the board don't say much. They speak as a, a, a very rarely. Daniel occasionally puts out statements on the on the club website. Now, you can say that other chair, other clubs speak too much and uh, others don't, you know, you, you don't really hear from John Henry. But you've got managers there who seem to be more obvious spokesmen for the club in terms of Klopp, in terms of Ten Hag, in terms of Arteta, in terms of Guardiola, whereas for all his abilities, Antonio Conte is a spokesman for Antonio Conte. Well, Fabio Prasci was putting out regular updates and they seem to have stopped. Um, and even in the last, what, 48 hours or so, the uh, official supporters' trust have now written to the club saying or, or, or asking for... Um, you know, a description of what's happening. Uh, yeah. What What do you think will happen, Martin? Because do you think that there could be a change in ownership in the next few years? Uh, yeah, in the next few years. But we'd look at, look, look, they want three and a half billion plus. Yeah. Well, who's got three and a half billion plus? The American would-be owners who might have been interested in spending money on, because they felt that the Premier League, still think the Premier League is an undervalued commodity. But one of the reasons they think it's undervalued is because they could see the Super League coming. Well, the Super League's gone. Super League's done and dusted. And I, 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 and I know why. I understand why Spurs signed up to it, because they couldn't afford to not be in it. But I think they were wrong to do so. And I've said that to people on the board. And, you know, it's just a personal opinion. I think it, it flew in the face of, of what fans want, but I also understood why they did it. And also, it's interesting that Spurs and Arsenal were on board well before Manchester City and Chelsea were. Manchester City and Chelsea were the last two on board the train. And Spurs and Arsenal felt they had to be on the train. Simple as that. They couldn't afford to miss out. And if you remember, a few years before that, there had been a meeting with um, Charlie Stilatano, who at the time was... Uh, very high up um, at Relevant Sports, Stephen Ross's group, who are promoters of football in the States. And Daniel wasn't invited to the meeting and the other five were. So that hastened, uh, intensified his determination to be part of anything that happened. So, so I get all that. But it does mean that with the, the collapse effectively of Super League, which will be confirmed in March, April, when the uh, European Court of Justice final ruling basically says UEFA have got the right to do what they want and they can ban you for joining a breakaway rebel organisation. You can join one, but you subject to punishments. When that is yeah. confirmed, which is what we were signalled from the the initial ruling in December of the or the uh, opinion, the non-binding opinion of the Advocate General of the Court. Once that situation has, has evolved, there is no obvious appeal in terms of long-term exponential growth in in revenue of the club. So the American owners disappear. So what you've got left then, who can afford to spend three and a half billion? It's sovereign wealth funds. There's only so many of them. And, you know, so Qatar theoretically could, 
by Spurs, but not if PSG are in the Champions League. Because you can't have two comp two teams under your ownership in the same competition. Saudi have got Newcastle, Abu Dhabi have got Man City, Bahrain potentially, uh, Oman. You know, there's not that many sovereign wealth funds out there, um, so it, it's harder and harder. Um, but I think that the expectation is that at some point the board will decide that they have taken it as far as they can and try to cash in. But they will they will demand a very high price. They will demand three and a half billion quid. Yeah. What do you think is um what do you think uh, would be the best thing for the club to do now then? Put out some kind of video, some kind of update, updating fans about the ambition, because of course that is what the supporters trust is is wanting at the moment. I would like to see more explanation from the board, from Daniel, as to what, where things are going to go, where the, what the policy, not minutiae, not who he thinks the next right back should be. That's, that's not for him. But I think it would benefit people, fans, everyone, for there to be a sort of a state of the nation statement from Daniel. Where we are, where we've been, where we're going to go. Also explaining sometimes the re really genuine reasons why things haven't happened or things have happened as they have. Because there'll be financial reasons that we're not entirely party to, that we don't know entirely about. And if that were to be made clearer, it wouldn't satisfy everyone, but at least it would give a bit more of, a, of an understanding. And I would like there to be more regular explanation i don't mean every week or every month or every three months yeah. but i think we could do with a with a bit of a long form explainer even if it's getting you know on the website a q a with paul coy or whomever i'm not to just diminish paul at all i really like paul i say someone who who will not necessarily grill daniel but will ask some of the questions would be possibly a good thing I think they should probably invite fan channels like this uh, uh, to, to, to board members, and we put we put Thank questions. You, to them. There would be a feel feel they become too antagonistic, and I and I get that. So you want to have it controlled. But obviously, Chris, you're such a nice chap that there'd be no ish, no issues at all. In fact, you'd be accused of being a sellout if you did that. So you, you can't. <laughs> win. You'd certainly report on that, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, Lastly, Martin, of course, we're in FA Cup action on Saturday against Portsmouth. Um, can you really believe 1991, when we won it for a record eighth time, was the last time we won the FA Cup? It's frightening, isn't it? Absolutely terrifying. Um, you know, I grew up with Spurs being in the Cup final every few years, it felt. Uh, and certainly that period, in, you know, 81, 82, 87, 91, four Cup finals, three wins in, in 11 seasons. It was our natural home. Yeah. Um, not anymore, is it? Even though we played there for a year, for two years. Um, it's a strange feeling. You get to the cup, FA Cup third round and you're thinking, OK, right, well, we've got Portsmouth. Like, that's what should, should win that. Although made our work of Cheltenham, was it last season? I can't remember some... Do, do, Morecambe, do, do, Mor yeah. do, do you know, it's like... I just feel every time we have one of these cup competitions, it's like the best chance of winning a trophy. Yeah. We talk about yeah, players yeah. like Harry Kane, Son and Lloris not winning anything at Spurs. Surely this has got to be our best chance. You've got to win six games. Six games in four months to win a trophy. Um, and, you know, often the first two or three games are, are shoo-ins. Let's be honest. I mean, look, Spurs... You know, that, 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 Portsmouth's best player is a Spurs player and can't play against us tomorrow. So there's no, no excuse there. Um, yeah. I just think, yes, actually, they sh it, it's, it should be something that you really tell. But look, we've had a lot of... I'm sick of semi-final defeats in the FA Cup. I've got to tell you. Yeah. Too many of those over the years. Yeah. I think it's about, is it about eight since we got to the final in 91. Too many. Too, too yeah. many. I remember too many bad days. Newcastle, Arsenal, Chelsea, uh, Everton, and some others as well. Oh, I, I hate semi-finals. 
I really hate semi-finals. God, they're miserable. I, I was trying to end this stream on a high, Martin. Well, yeah, but maybe <laughs> this is it. This year we'll get to the semi-final and win it. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we beat Portsmouth the last time we won the FA Cup on the on the way. Uh, I think it was Indeed. in the fifth round. Um, Indeed, that was a that was a, that was a away game at uh, at Fatton Park, wasn't it? Where Gaza scored a couple. Yeah. And that was it. Can we have Oxford at some point in this run then? And uh, who else did we play on that? Notts County. Oh, they're, yeah. they're not in anymore. All of those teams that have that. That will do. Yeah. I'll take that. Definitely. Well, um, lastly, Martin, last question. Um, of course, when we go back in Premier League action, we've got Arsenal at home and Manchester City away. What's your predictions for those two games? Gosh. Um, all depends on the team we've got out, actually. If we've got a first team out, Kulisewski and Ben Tankur, and we play like we did in the corresponding games last season, it could be really good. Yeah. If we haven't got them, and we play like we played at Arsenal earlier this season, it's going to be a horrible couple of games. And it could end the season in terms of top four. So it's huge. Beat Arsenal and lose to City, that's not terrible. Yeah. Because uh, then we've got to play City again a fortnight later or so. We could do without that, but that's the way it goes. Lose both, horrific. In some ways, if we have to win a game, we're better beating Arsenal, I think. Because obviously it hurts Arsenal and losing to City hurts Arsenal. Uh, and I'm sorry, it's awful, but you're actually thinking about anything to stop Arsenal winning the league, aren't you? Because that's just general fans' thought. But that's not going to happen, is it? We've got, well, to, to be fair, they have been excellent. I know it's awful to admit it. They've been the best team in the, in the league this season, without question. Uh, it helps that they've not had too many injuries. Um, but they have, I mean, they've had a freakish number of players who've played every, every game. Is it nine, of, nine, at least eight of the starting team have played every game? That's remarkable. Yeah. Um, and, you know, their first team, apart from Gabriel Jesus, you know, you can pick it straight away. Now, not, but not many people you can, you can say that to. Um, yeah. But I did think City looked quite good for the 20 minutes they bothered to turn up at Chelsea last night. Uh, and they, I still think with Holland that they probably end up winning the league. And I'd rather them win the league, obviously, than the other lot for reasons we uh, we just need another fantastic atmosphere at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium against Arsenal. Um, what score prediction are you going with for that yeah. game? Sorry? What score prediction are you going for for that game? I, I think it'd probably end up in the draw, actually. Oh, I then, thought we were ending it on a high, Martin. Well, we're, we're, we're going to go <laughs> and smash them. <laughs> 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 Martin, you've been a brilliant guest again. I love having you on. Um, I could talk to you for hours about football. Um, please tell everyone where they can find you on social media and what they can expect from your work in the near future. Uh, well, I'm only on Twitter, actually, so it's at Martin Lipton. Um, and I've written about Gianluca Viali uh, in tomorrow's paper, which is uh, very sad news, actually, because yeah. I, I, I really like Gianluca. He's a lovely bloke. Uh, and very sad he died so so young, just two years older than me at 58 is, is horrible. And then the madness of football begins. I'm going to have a, a, there's a lot of things going on in the sports politics, which is really my bag these days. Um, we've got uh, Premier League issues go, uh, going on. We have uh, FA issues with the away from FIFA going on. We have Super League dying a death, I hope, by the middle of the, uh, uh, of the, of the year. Plus you know, uh, changes to the 2026 World Cup, all of those things, which are very much my my province, were in in the paper. Uh, and let's just see what the refereeing VAR situation is under Howard Webb, because that's still very interesting. That's going to be going to evolve, I think, over the season. Uh, I think we need to think about how we we run things in the in the in the country. I think we need to follow the uh, the FIFA lead on timekeeping personally, because we're not doing that this season. But we will see. But the great thing about football is, you know, just when you think you've seen everything, you're proven wrong. That's just what happens. And it will be, as ever, a crazy few months because nobody quite knows the impact of the World Cup. We're about to find out over yeah. the next four or five months and anything's possible. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, Martin, thanks so much for your time. I've really enjoyed talking to you this evening. And uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for listening. I'll see you on the next one. Until then, come on, you Spurs.